Um, we're now going to shift over to the capital markets. Uh, Ed, I think you're going to take us through it. If we can try and do this in 15 minutes, okay. that would be good. I'm just trying to keep uh, an eye on that. Uh, quickly. Uh, Jay provided us with a nice introduction. Uh, clearly, the capital requirements across the continent are just immense. Uh, the need to access capital and the importance of developing the markets have been pervasive themes for us. Uh, Secretary Pritzker mentioned, and we took an initial step with the Institutional Roadshow, and I'd say this was very good as a communicative device, but it was also gave us a much better understanding of what the issues were. And we divided it into two parts. One was specific deals speaking to specific investors. And I'll come back to that in just one second. The second was sort of a healthy interchange at a very high level with the heads of delegations, including pointing out the impediments. And kind of one thing that became very clear is there are immense capital needs. There's a tremendous amount of global capital. How do you marry the two? What are the mechanisms, whether it be risk mitigation, uh, aggregating assets, or something? This is the next step in the process to capital. As you'll see, we have a uh, multi-pronged approach, which is what I like to call pick and shovel work. We're kind of right at the bottom, knocking it out. So with that, Peter's going to take us through initially. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Ed. Secretary Pritzker, nice to be with you. Ambassador Froman, uh, Department of Commerce and Council members, uh, thank you for your continued commitment to developing trade and investment strategies in Africa. As you know, Africa is a powerful component of the global economy, and Bloomberg is fully committed to an advanced economic partnership between the United States and Africa. We work very closely with Africa's central bankers, security regulators, and financial institutions. In fact, one of our focus areas has been developing the bond markets in Africa. You may recall that we recently collaborated with FMDQ, the financial market, markets dealer quotation market, uh, excuse me, to create a Nigerian bond trading platform and market surveillance system to bring a more transparent, liquid, and efficient bond market to Nigeria. We also recently collaborated with the African Development Bank to create an African bond index because we saw a clear need for a transparent and objective benchmark for sovereign debt in Africa. Bond issuance and trading mechanisms provide a necessary vehicle for institutional investment, and we need to help African countries develop the platforms and infrastructure for this investment to occur. I believe the utilization of technology can help bring capital market to higher growth levels by leaps and bounds. And last April, I presented a recommendation that was focused on making Africa's capital markets more robust by bolstering the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's technical assistance program for regulatory officials. Today, we'd like to build upon this recommendation on the public sector side, we should explore ways for the SEC to have resident advisors at African securities regulators focused solely on capital markets. It's imperative that we also focus on the private sector. We need to inc increase human capacity by enhancing the expertise of investors and capital markets participants. For example, this can be done through capital markets roundtables, training programs, and internships. We should also support financial journalism, which will help bring investment and opportunities for access to capital to the continent. To advance financial journalism in Africa, Bloomberg Philanthropies, our sister entity, has launched Bloomberg Media Initiative Africa, a program that aims to increase the pipeline of skilled financial journalists and analysts and embraces a data-driven culture across Africa. It's important that we promote these kind of programs and give support to the participants. And finally, I'd also like to provide an update on the Bloomberg initiatives I announced at our council last meeting. You may recall that I announced two important commitments at our last meeting. First, to advance the goal of strengthening capital markets, I announced Bloomberg and its grant to the Financial Services Volunteer Corps to sponsor a technical assistance program in Africa. I'm pleased to announce that our support will allow the FSVC to deliver technical assistance to the Kenyan capital markets authorities to help Kenyan markets become a gateway for regional and international capital flows. 
And second, to advance the goals of the Council, I announced that Bloomberg is committed to hosting a business and economic summit in Africa in early 2016. The summit, tapping Bloomberg's editorial and analytical resources on the continent and beyond, will convene top international and local executives and policymakers for a deeper look at Africa's e uh, domestic economies and an exploration of African nations' role in the changing global economy. Bloomberg journalists will lead conversations focused on issues including energy, technology, infrastructure, the opportunities and, and risks of doing business in the region, and the strengthening of the Africans, African capital markets. As the host, I'm pleased to let you know that this will take place in Cape Town uh, on February 23rd and 24th, and I very much look forward to continuing to discuss ways to increase investment and access to capital at the summit. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Melissa Cook, do you have comments? Yes, I do. Thank you. I just would like to follow on the um, institutional investor conversation that we've been having. First of all, to take a very broad view of who these institutional investors are. We've been talking specifically about pension managers, endowments, and foundations, but we also have the money managers and then the people who are actually the shareholders of the U.S. and international companies which are engaged on the continent. And what I see is a misperception of risk, which I think results in incorrect <coughs> pricing of the capital that's allocated to the projects or to the companies. So I think um, the work that's being described as far as um, upgrading the capital markets on the continent is one step in trying to bring in a stronger supply of capital. Um, and then that will help reduce the risk element that's involved in any company's hurdle rate as they calculate where to put money on the work, uh, money to work on the continent. I also think, uh, again, looking at the perspective of these very large institutions, it's a very time-consuming, very expensive task for them to get educated. Anything that adds friction to the process, whether it's the capital markets not being robust enough, I think makes it harder. So the work that we're doing can continue um, to, to, to help with that. I think um, institutional investors also require access to a lot of different vehicles. And it may be, you know, it may be a good idea for us to involve some of the intermediaries in this conversation, um, specifically some of the U.S. banks and investment banks to the extent they're allowed to do this under, under their current regulatory regime. And I also think uh, with respect to the Institutional Investor Roadshow, what we had in New York recently was a very good start. I thought the conversations were very high quality. Um, I would also just remind people that a lot of the big money managers in particular um, are not necessarily ready to travel to Africa for that type of due diligence and so on an opportunistic basis when we have African officials in the U.S. it would be very helpful to continue that type of one-on-one -on -one engagement to get that conversation going. Thank you very much. Good. Um, just to close out, I think each of these recommendations is highlighted in the draft report. Uh, just to summarize, the huge needs are in infrastructure. Uh, there's obviously a need for uh, more depth and uh, breadth in the financial markets, the mechanics of how people invest, and finally, as Peter alluded to, the educational process is ongoing. So this, this is an ongoing long-term project, but I think we're kind of putting some bricks in the foundation to get started. One comment, I just thank you, by the way, too, for taking all, there's a rich amount of recommendations in there in a very short period of time, but I think this is one of the areas that sort of, I call it a Mount Everest, if you will, of w we look forward. I hope that we will have seen five years from now a delta shift in the, in the percent of institutional assets that are going into Africa. I think the roadshow was the beginning of that, as you mentioned, Melissa, but that we, we, we look at how we can get more of the pension funds to, to invest in, the, in that, get that moving. And, the, and on the capital markets, I think with the skill building that you've mentioned, Peter, which is terrific, but how do we also focus, maybe is it Kenya, Nigeria, to get it to get a local capital market with with long term debt and its own long term savings in there I think will also be be key. Um, I, I I want to do two things. One, I want to underscore what, what uh, Secretary Pritzker said before and that is making sure that we don't bite off too many things and really focus on the areas where we can execute successfully. Uh, another thing and, and I look Jay at you uh, for for this one of the things that I hear consistently, particularly from firms like big infrastructure funds, and that is the continuing concern about corruption in Africa 
and obviously as fiduciaries investing other people's money, that weighs very heavily in their sovereign risk evaluation country by country. And if there's some way we could come together through this group with a series of case studies and uh, relationships that can work with some of these infrastructure funds and get them over the hump, I think that would be uh, a real step forward. Maybe that's already going on. And Jay, you may have a perspective on that. But I do think that's a barrier to investment that needs to be addressed at some point. I, I don't disagree on the, <clears throat> on the perception of that. Um, there is work going on around that. There are certain countries, we talked a little bit about it this morning, um, but there are certain countries that are, are doing more than others. I think what you've seen in Nigeria from the election, et cetera, there seems to be some, some improvement in Kenya. Um, President Kenyatta has taken a number of officials out of office uh, and they're going now through the investigation. So I think it's a combination of, of utilizing uh, what we do as in this group or where we're going to focus on countries is making sure we're going to the countries that are doing the right stuff. Yeah. Now, there's still going to be issues here and there, as there is everywhere, but I think there's ways to do it. I think two things is uh, requiring, obviously, a transparent procurement process is one, <clears throat> and making sure that, uh, again, the, the aspect of sharing the decision making on whatever the procurement uh, results are is important. And then the other piece is making sure that the follow ons uh, continue to be focused on that. From a, person, from a standpoint of us doing business there, we find that um, having the ability and, and the knowledge that uh, how we operate sometimes tends to be an advantage in that countries want to do business with a company like ours. Mm -hmm. U.S. bat, you know, U.S. multinational with with all of the integrity, et cetera, that that we we highlight. So, Good. I think that's a, a way to do it. But I think it's also making sure that what we do here with the council with countries, we're we're putting it where we think the countries are doing the right things. Uh, just to uh, conclude, I think with the U.S. trade representative here, we'd be remiss not to mention what a problem currencies have been in terms of investing in Africa. <laughs> Uh, it is just quite dramatic. I think uh, Nigeria is, what, down almost 30 percent this year. The Rond in South Africa has been down, must be down 50 or 60 percent over the last two or three years. I mean, this is really a major, major issue for these countries. Thank you. Any other comments on the yeah, capital yeah, side? Okay, I'm going to suggest, uh, Shelley, we go to uh, trade and supply chain where we've got three recommendations. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks again for convening the council. It has been uh, an incredible experience and I think has allowed me to go back home to Walmart with not only renewed uh, enthusiasm but renewed confidence on the future of doing business uh, in Africa. And because within our group, uh, sits customers at all ends of the supply chain, from a startup business to raw material, all the way through to commerce uh, with the actual customer. Um, we're very glad to have a seat at the table together. And putting our recommendations together, we are fortunate that not only do we sit at each stage of the supply chain, but each one has material impacts, from uh, Hershey procuring raw materials, from startup businesses, from Walmart working on procurement and logistics all the way through agriculture, we've had the opportunity to share with you some real life experiences that we've had on doing business uh, within the continent. And one of the stories that I told last time about the, our inability to move product across uh, borders has resulted in some real change. It's resulted in um, countries who prior hadn't discussed the fact that it takes 47 days to get through a border. So we're starting to see some material impact just by sharing real life examples of what happens on doing business on the continent. I'll spend a few minutes talking about our first recommendation, which is regionalization, and then I'll hand it over to Martin to talk about our second two um, important recommendations. So you may recall that we talked about trade facilitation with a real emphasis on regional harmonization last time we met. And the first recommendation absolutely continues to focus on that theme. 
it's very clear, we even talked about it a bit this morning, that when we try to focus on the entire continent of Africa, it becomes quickly apparent that just the size and scale and diversity of the continent becomes very daunting. And that as retailers, we are the first to recognize that there are incredible regional differences in speed, in preference, in the economy, um, certainly in FX, and in their ability to import and export products. So in order to do what we like to do best, which is satisfy our customer, we have had to focus down on certain regions. And if we want to increase customer choice, if we want to create great opportunities for businesses, we have got to build distribution chains that help bridge that gap between time and between distance. But these uh, incredibly divergent business conditions from logistic costs to cargo hold times uh, continue to make supply chains not just prohibitively uh, expensive, but also not reliable. And so Secretary Pritzker has talked about being in Africa for the long haul and willing to make that investment. I think companies are willing to make that investment, there, but there's got to be some reliability that comes along with that. And so certainly the U.S. government understands that, and, it, and we really acknowledge the great work that has already been done on the regional level, especially with the EAC, with the East African communities. The work that the EAC demonstrates is that a regional approach can be an incredibly effective tool, a way not to focus on the whole, but to start improving regions, which will then set the example for the whole and help speed change. And so our recommendation is that we continue to develop that renewed focus on regional policy with regard to the economic community of West African states. So the council members have recognized that ECOWAS is an incredibly dynamic region. And yes, it's complex. It's complex with language issues. It's complex with government. It's got brand new leaders in place. But the population, the access to ports with 11 ports, growing population, uh, a strong raw materials background, leads us to believe that focusing as our next region of emphasis on ECOWAS will really uh, add to um, our growth for the long term on the continent. So in addition, we believe that that renewed strategy could build on existing fra frameworks that are in place today, so not starting from scratch, um, and perhaps using the trade and investment framework agreement that is already in place. So we have some very specific recommendations in the, in, within our uh, agreement that you can see that very much mirror what happened uh, and what's happening today in the EAC. And to talk briefly, I'll turn that over to you, Rahima. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I just wanted to add the importance when it comes Can you just push your, sorry, the, the red button? When it comes to um, cross-border trade and looking at regional borders, <coughs> the importance of creating one-stop help centers that can help facilitate trade for young people, trade for for women specifically around customs issues, security issues, and other business transactions. Because a lot of times, trying to get your products over the border, a lot of people who are going to the border, they don't understand the different rules and the different regulations that they're working with. So these one-stop centers would be very useful to providing the support that these small traders need. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Rahima. And we absolutely understand that the private sector plays an important role in doing this and telling our story and having actual um, factual mapping of products crossing across the region has been instrumental in the EAC and we're proving that that is starting to become successful in the ECOWAS area as well. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Martin Rieschenhagen to talk about our two next suggestions. Shirley, thank you very much. Uh, my first proposal uh, you find under number six in the recommendation uh, feedback uh, it's simple, it's easy to implement, it has measurable objectives, a defined time frame and doesn't need additional funding. Uh, access to finance is the main obstacle for the development of each stage of the agribusiness value chain. Instead of reinventing the wheel and creating new programs and initiatives, we believe we should uh, use existing tools and optimize them such as the Development Credit Authority Program of USAID, 
that facilitate access to credit. We notably recommend that DCA accelerate the average time to implement credit guarantee facilities from eight months to four months from January 2016 on latest. Notably, as time is of the essence in agriculture. The second proposal uh, comes with a trademark uh, at the end I have registered for already. It's about uh, education and training, not only in agriculture, but mainly in agriculture, and you find it under, under point number seven. Capacity building through training is key for the development of Africa. The US private sector has already a lot of initiatives in place to provide practical training, and the US government should capitalize on those initiatives. I think what it needs would be kind of a curriculum, a layout, uh, and a maybe cooperation with a, with, a, with a college and the trademark, I would like to call it the Penny Pritzker School of Business. Uh, <laughs> the U.S. government can put in place tools that the U.S. and African private sector need to work together, and therefore we look to forward to see uh, the prompt implementation of these recommendations. And uh, a last point is more for your information. We have two weeks ago launched with our GSI division a container uh, range of container size uh, cold chain storage units, which come with a power generator and solar power during daylight. And uh, um, I can tell you that really this helps to fix this problem quickly, of course, for the smaller uh, shops and the smaller farmers and so on. Thank you very much. Shelley, back to you. So, thank you, Martin. So, so in summary, regional integration, utilizing ECOWAS as our uh, region of preference, uh, access to finance through the value chain by not starting with, uh, from scratch, but really utilizing some things through, through USAID and through the DCA that are in place already today and then having the inaugural class through the Penny Pritzker School of Commerce, but continuing to uh, focus on a long-term sustainable training for growth. Uh, I pass on the school idea, but um, <laughs> uh, just on the ECOWAS, um, I think e ECOWAS, uh, you know, that focus is, is consistent with um, focus of the U.S. government, so I think that that makes a lot of sense, particularly, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of efforts going on there. But recently, I just want to make sure you're aware, the U.S. ECOWAS Council on Trade and Investment established our, uh, you know, TIFA agreement, mm -hmm. um, and they held their first council meeting on the margins of the AGOA uh, summit. And uh, in August, so ECOWAS is, a, I think, a key factor in the transition to or another regionally integrated market in West Africa. And I think that there's alignment of focus there is what I want the point I wanted to make. Any other comments? Yeah, please. If you just also, if you just identify yourself too as we go through it, particularly for the live stream. Uh, I'm Flori Luzier. I'm the assistant USTR for Africa. And uh, in addition to the TIPA Council meeting that we held um, on the sidelines of the AGOA Forum, um, uh, we are also um, looking to embed a technical advisor in the ECOWAS Commission and to work with them specifically on um, implementing the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. And we uh, took note of your recommendation that this was an important area for us to work on. And then one last thing, um, a few weeks ago uh, during UNGA, um, we witnessed the signing of an MOU between the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and um, ECOWAS, uh, identifying ways for ECOWAS businesses and U.S. businesses to work more closely together. Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID, the Bureau of Africa. Um, in addition to what has already been indicated by my colleagues in the other agencies, USAID has been working very closely and has an embedded advisor also at ECOWAS to work on regionalization. 
So we have been working on regionalization and we'll continue and expand that, especially in light of the TICB, the Trade and Investment Capacity Building Initiative, and the expansion of our trade hub to a trade and investment hub in West Africa. Thank you. Please. Hi, I'm Andrea Lockwood from the Department of Energy, and I apologize for being late for the energy section. The line outside was uh, quite amazing. But uh, I did want to comment just in, in general on some of the topics that had been raised in the, in the trade section because they apply to, to energy trade and energy development. And we are uh, very focused on uh, regional trade for energy because I know that that makes uh, investment a lot more attractive. And looking at the capacity uh, building section, uh, that's something that the department is focused on in our Africa efforts. And what we hear from governments is that, that they really need uh, that uh, additional uh, work together with us and with the companies to think about what kinds of targeted training will really um, answer the, uh, the gaps that you see both in the policies and regulatory structures that you're looking for uh, that will encourage uh, the investment in, in energy and then also just in meeting those um, local content requirements that many countries have that are very difficult uh, to deal with in terms of uh, ensuring the quality of your product and, and service. So um, I look, I appreciated uh, the comments uh, very much, and uh, and look forward to working further uh, with the companies on these issues. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Shelley, for that uh, overview and those three recommendations. Um, why don't we shift over, Karen, to okay. the next? Of the recommendation number eight uh, is about developing an inclusive business culture and the importance of entrepreneurism, especially as it relates to women and youth. And Rahama Wright is going to present that recommendation. Thank you, Karen. My colleagues have done a fantastic job sharing recommendations that span supply chain development, health care, and infrastructure. My job here today is to convey the critical importance of engaging young people and women through all facets of business development and business engagement on the continent of Africa. I dare say the glue that holds all of our recommendations together is women. The Obama administration has already shown that it has made commitments to supporting young people through the Young African Leaders Program, as well as the African Women's Entrepreneurship Program. However, more can be done. First, uh, Martin talked about this, which is human capacity development. There is an opportunity for uh, higher learning institutions, historically black colleges and universities, to partner with African colleges and institutions to develop exchange programs where African business educators can, learn, can develop their skills in terms of developing curriculum, um, understanding business practices from our perspective, and really providing them the support to do research on diverse topics when it comes to uh, business in Africa. There's also a tremendous need for accurate and current data uh, when it comes to women and young people in business in Africa. And I think that this is where the US Census Bureau can assist African governments with collecting data and disaggregating data based on gender and age. Uh, the US Census Bureau, through its international programs, already trains national uh, bureaus in other countries on how to do this. And so I think that there's a role here for uh, African governments to start collecting the data that can be utilized to make better decisions when it comes to looking at women and looking at youth. Additionally, there's issues when it comes to populations that are mostly excluded from traditional business, tend to be poor and tend to be isolated, and also have difficulty getting access to national ID cards. If you can't get access to a national ID card, which is connected to being unable to get access to birth certificates, it excludes you from being able to access government resources. It also excludes you from being able to access banking services. And so this is an opportunity for um, the Census Bureau, again, to work with African governments to help them create programs to collect uh, vital statistics recording systems. In addition to that, um, 
there, in addition to the to the ID issue, is uh, women and their ability to gain access to property rights and inheritance rights. And this is a place where USAID country missions can encourage African government authorities to secure property rights for women, enabling them to be able to access the financial resources to be able to build and grow their businesses. Additionally, the condition precedents that have been set forth by the MCC can provide examples of different laws that African governments have changed in order to address some of the gender disparities within, within their legal systems. And the last thing I would like to touch upon is the uh, judicial systems and really strengthening judicial systems. Um, oftentimes, entrepreneurs can find themselves in legal disputes, whether it's with uh, creditors, wholesalers, other business owners and they don't have access to the ability to address these issues. And this is where small claims courts can play a, an important role. Uh, the World Bank states that only 46% of all African countries actually have small claims courts. And I think that there's an opportunity where the US government can help African governments develop the judicial mechanisms through educating and creating connections between um, judicial officers here in the U.S. and in creating partnerships with them in, on the continent to train them on how to establish such um, systems within their countries. And so I would like to turn it over to Melissa, who also had some thoughts around um, developing inclusive business. Thanks, Rama, and thank you for all the great work that you did uh, putting this recommendation together. Again, Melissa Cook from African Sunrise Partners. I just want to build on this in terms of what it means for entrepreneurs to be in the formal economy as opposed to the informal economy. And I think this is something where we can encourage governments to remove the barriers to having these entrepreneurs join the formal economy. If you're in an informal economy, you don't pay taxes, you're subject to harassment from the authorities, you can't get proper bank financing, you're generally doomed to stay small. So as we think about the energy from these entrepreneurs and where they're going to be going over the next five to 10 years, I think having them in the formal economy is not only important for their sustainability and their growth, but also when you think about political stability, when you have voters who feel engaged with the government that they're supporting through their tax payments, they are much more likely to hold those politicians to account and uh, really have a stake in the future of their own country. And, and that's been a very important step that we've seen taken now in Nigeria. We'll see it elsewhere. And I think bringing these, uh, encouraging governments to re remove the barriers for these small entrepreneurs is something that we should, we should have on the list. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And I also apologize. I was in the line for over an hour. So. Um, trying to get in, um, but, but uh, I waited in line for an hour because I think this is hugely important and, um, and I really appreciate the recommendations that, that you've given here. Um, as was mentioned, uh, we have uh, several programs for inclusion that are up and running, both the um, African Women's Entrepreneurship Program as well as the We Create Program um, and, and several new uh, chapters of those are going to be opening. Um, we intend to create three new centers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Zambia, Kenya, and Mali over the next two years. Um, and We Create is going to open, did open, sorry, in Zambia in June. And so, you know, these are hugely important things. Um, one other thing that we just launched at the UN General Assembly, which I think is also hugely important to engaging youth and those who have not been engaged and also brings people into the formal economy is um, an initiative to bring 1.5 billion people internet connectivity who haven't had it and we're gonna focus on Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa as one of the major focuses um, because we believe the opportunity to engage in the, the business world through that kind of connectivity is going to, is going to be huge and, and can capture youth and can capture those who haven't uh, had a chance and can also be a real gateway for small and medium businesses who've had trouble accessing markets. So um, the plan is to work with other governments and to work with the governments in Sub-Saharan Africa to both 
actually do the connectivity, but to have the policies in place that are going to promote that kind of connectivity, as well as to work with the private sector. So we'll look forward to working with everybody on this. Peter. Uh, Peter Grauer, the chairman of Bloomberg. Uh, just to, to take this issue a little bit further, I've, I've been incredibly dedicated to the issue of diversity and inclusion, both in our company but also in the larger business community by, through my work as the founding chairman of the uh, United States version of the 30 percent club. And for those of you who don't know, the 30 percent club is a group of business leaders who are committed to voluntary action towards better gender balance at all levels, and I underscore all levels of their organizations. We've made tremendous strides in achieving more women leaders through this process. In addition to the U.S. and the U.K., there are 30% clubs today in Hong Kong, Ireland, Canada, Australia, and Southern Africa. The Southern Africa chapter launched in September of 2014, and this initiative is a significant step forward towards increasing executive women leadership representation in Africa. We're shifting the mindset from this being a women's issue to a mainstream business issue and a talent management imperative. The economic case for better gender diversity at senior levels of organizations is strong. Diverse companies have enhanced financial performance and are much more innovative when they embrace this approach. There is clearly a powerful, intuitive argument for having a varied board and executive team, but there's a lot of work to be done to achieve a faster rate of change, and I'm glad that we're tackling these important issues in Africa as well. Um, just one comment that may be relevant to both this recommendation and the supply chain recommendation, which is the um, Economic Development Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce, has been working with Harvard and a number of different countries around the world to create cluster mapping tools. A cluster mapping tool basically is a dynamic tool to allow investors and manufacturers and others to understand the supply chain and the infrastructure and the human capital talent available in different areas. And we might want to think about is there a role for maybe one of the regions uh, and uh, working to develop a cluster mapping tool uh, as, a, as a, uh, an example of what can, the kind of data and information that could help new businesses form and uh, new investors find areas to plug into existing supply chains. Any other comments, please? Uh, could you just push the button? USAID, is it on? USAID fully believes in supporting an inclusive business environment, and it is incorporated in all of our projects, particularly in support of traditionally marginalized populations, youth, women, and LGBTQ individuals. In this regard, we work directly with ministries to adopt and implement policies to make their business enabling environments more attractive both to the local business as well as to foreign business, international business investment. And we particularly focus on broad-based growth. In addition, we support human capacity development through our training programs, both in agriculture as well as in our economic growth programs. And within our value chains, we prioritize gender and youth for sustainable outcomes. Our YALI program supports in-person, online, and bricks and mortar spaces to equip young entrepreneurs to take leadership in their communities. We also try to assure that there is a linkage between the programs we are doing and YALI. So we are certainly moving and working in the various areas that have already been raised by the uh, council. Thank you. And look forward to any other suggestions. And I think we'll, we'll close on that uh, final recommendation. And we're very excited to have Secretary Fox, uh, who's, uh, who's joined us, playing an instrumental role 
uh, on the infrastructure side, which is something that we've talked about, and has just led a delegation to Africa. So welcome. Thank we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank you for uh, your leadership and uh, also to my colleague, Secretary Pritzker, for her leadership in assembling the council. Uh, I understand Michael Froman either has been here or is coming, so I want to acknowledge him and all of you for the work you're doing. Um, I took a uh, trade mission um, uh, from uh, uh, here to Africa back in the summer and at the request of Secretary Pritzker, and uh, this was an extension of the goals of the President and this Council uh, to work to write a new chapter in U.S.-Africa relations. The goals held true. Uh, Africa's economy is growing. We saw the evidence of it with our own eyes. Uh, there are many opportunities to forge new economic partnerships that can create jobs and grow businesses on both continents. I had several bilateral meetings, including one with uh, Kenyan President Kenyatta in advance of the President's visit there, who said to me, Africa simply wants to do business. He said that the time for these partnerships is right, and frankly, if these opportunities are not pursued, they will become challenges instead. I was very interested to learn more about Sub-Saharan Africa's transportation needs in particular, and to see how we could help Africans address them. And every official I met stressed the importance of a better regional transportation network, um, crossing the border of countries even. Uh, one notable discussion I had was with some auto executives in South Africa who explained to me that it's actually cheaper to transport the cars they make into areas like Kenya by plane than to do it on the surface. And that's just one example of some of the transportation <laughs> challenges that are confronted. Uh, my mission was ultimately broader than just transportation. As I said, Secretary Prisker's team also accompanied us, and we had executives from 14 U.S. firms specializing in transportation, agriculture, and energy. These business leaders came because they knew there were opportunities to trade and invest in Africa, but they also had a hard time developing the business relationships and the government relationships to enable them to partner. And we heard from those executives that they saw more opportunities in Africa than even they expected going in. I also met with ministers uh, of other countries, including the Prime Minister of Mozambique, uh, to advocate for a more liberalized uh, and transparent business environment, and also for opening uh, their skies through open skies agreements and other uh, multimodal issues. We had some very significant outcomes. Uh, for one thing, in South Africa, the Minister of Transportation, after many years of discussing an Open Skies Agreement, finally agreed with our Open Skies philosophy and work is underway to uh, strengthen uh, our relationship through uh, an Open Skies-like agreement with South Africa. And he also no she also noted that South African Airlines needs to buy new aircraft, which is a business opportunity for us. Uh, President Kenyatta, going back to Kenya, told me that Kenya is trying to resolve technical issues that will allow it to have direct flights to the U.S. We also had the opportunity to discuss the status of American package of en energy and infrastructure projects that supports the Lamu Port South Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor, or what's called LAPSET for which the Memorandum of Understanding was signed during the President's visit. This effort speaks to the regional cooperation that is highlighted in your, your efforts. A big focus of the mission was also on empowering Africans, including emerging leaders. Uh, we actually did an event in Johannesburg uh, with YALI, and uh, we announced the knowledge building program in Johannesburg called Tomorrow's Transportation Leaders. We met some very impressive young uh, Africans who were in college and engineering schools who were very interested in transportation careers, and I had uh, several hours with them and a, and a lot of great interaction. And in every meeting and every event, we made it very clear that the business case for women's inclusion in transportation and the economy as a whole is also critical. 
We announced hosting workshops that will focus on skills development for women because any nation that fails to empower its women won't succeed in the global economy. Uh, one final point, the country officials I met with recognized that U.S. companies can do more than provide services or build infrastructure. Our businesses and our business leaders can play a role in fostering skills development across the continent. Um, in uh, several countries, for example, G General Electric is uh, doing a great job of developing training programs, hiring locally, helping to contribute to uh, the growth and expansion of skills in Africa. I think our business model is so much better than what the rest of the world usually brings to them, which is building stuff very quickly using their own uh, labor and uh, leaving the country with uh, no, no additional skills. And so I think we saw very tangible evidence that there was a preference for a model that was actually collaborative and growing. So I want to commend the council for the continued work you do. It was a great, uh, great experience for me to be able to be part of this, uh, this trade mission. Secretary Pritzker, thank you for, um, for allowing me to do this in your stead, and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you going forward. No, Secretary Fox, it's me who should thank you. I really appreciate your leadership, so thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we've thank really you. been privileged by having so many people in the cabinet. You see the seriousness of this effort uh, today, just from the, the comments, such as Secretary Fox is on that, which is very, very encouraging. We have a bit of time for any open comments before we close. So I don't know if anyone just in, in broadly have seen the eight recommendations. We've got this trip coming up in January, as we mentioned before, which we want to be quite focused on what we're trying to achieve and deliver from that, and then later on, uh, the summit. Agnes Dasevich from USAID. I just wanted to uh, make two comments which broadly apply, I think, to both the capital markets uh, recommendation as well as the infrastructure and energy recommendations. Um, there are two activities that we have started, partly as a result of, of the early recommendations of this committee. One is, uh, in cooperation with Treasury, USAID is working very closely with the African Development Bank to help expand and make more efficient its partial guarantee and credit guarantee program, which we feel could apply to both the energy projects, infrastructure projects on the continent, as well as to bringing more institutional investors to the continent who are all looking for risk mitigation measures, such as those that the African Development Bank can offer. We're also working very closely with our uh, guarantee authority, DCA, on looking at how we can help municipal financing on the continent, which we hope will generate more bankable projects. Um, and that uh, guarantee work is also going to be complemented by capacity building for municipalities in order to develop and execute these bankable projects and bring them to the market. And we feel that might also result in a lot of opportunities in energy and infrastructure and help develop further the capital markets on the continent. Uh, just uh, two points regarding, uh, first with the energy infrastructure uh, recommendations, just wanted to um, not only support uh, Jay's presentation, uh, but also let him know that, you know, there are many firms like mine that are very focused on infrastructure uh, and, and certainly want to continue to, to do work and, and invest in that regard, especially with respect to transmission and distribution work. So. Hi, Kate Kim from um, Millennium Challenge Corporation. Um, I just wanted to note that a lot of the recommendations had to do with policy and institutional reform and getting the commitment by the governments to really make sustainable changes <coughs> so that our investments by donors, U.S. government, as well as the private sector is sustainable. Um, whether it be, you know, related to things like land rights, particularly for women, to institutional strengthening and sector reform <coughs> in regards to energy, having the voice of the private sector at the table is extremely effective for us when we're having these conversations with our government counterparts. So when we say, you know, a credit-worthy off-taker for utilities is extremely important, having, you know, GEJ Ireland at the table saying that 
is actually more effective than MCC saying this to an energy minister. So um, having your voices at the table to really strengthen our voices in talking to the government in these areas um, can be extraordinarily effective. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Eric. Um, thank you. This is Eric Meyer from the Treasury Department. I just wanted to pick up on actually the last couple of comments there um, and highlight that a, we have at our disposal a couple of institutions, particularly the World Bank Group and the African Development Bank Group, that are strong partners of the United States in Africa in implementing a number of, of uh, programs that support many of the recommendations that are here. Um, so Agnes mentioned the guarantees work at the African Development Bank. We're also um, working very closely with the World Bank Group to improve the effectiveness of their guarantees programs. But also, as I continually, as I listen to others talk about the other recommendations, technical assistance, capacity building, um, innovative financing vehicles, building up local capital markets and domestic financing. Um, these institutions are critical partners of ours, meaning the United States, on the ground in Africa. And so I think we should, as you're looking at building out these recommendations, and particularly as you're on your trip talking to people, think about are there ways that you see that we can better use these institutions? Are there creative ideas that you have that we should be pursuing with them? Thank you. One more comment and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, yes, my name is Wanda Felton. I'm with the Export-Import Bank. I um, would like to offer uh, two suggestions uh, that relate to Secretary Prisker's uh, request for uh, actionable, more granular recommendations. And um, I want to be careful just to note at the outset that none of this has to do with Exim Bank. <laughs> um, it, one is uh, the, a couple of years ago, uh, the philanthropic, philanthropic arm of one of the uh, U.S. Electric Utility Trade Associations offered to um, create an exchange programs between U.S. electric utilities and uh, Africa's national utilities, many of which are in pretty dire financial condition. And that is a barrier to um, investment by U.S. companies and uh, financing by uh, the private sector and the, and the U.S. government. And um, this would involve bringing uh, uh, African executives to the uh, uh, participate and have training at the uh, U.S. companies in order to understand better how to run these companies in a more um, uh, efficient fashion that would make them more financeable, and bringing the U.S. retired and active executives to Africa. And I would suggest that this might be something that be, would be worth pursuing. Um, the second one has to do with uh, the uh, question about corruption and maybe of interest to Bloomberg. Uh, there's an NGO that is based in Tanzania that has done work around the continent. Uh, they have financing from a number of de development finance uh, organizations, uh, institutions around Europe, and they have shown the ability to tackle specific uh, corruption issues by targeting small investments in technology um, and that have created transparency and reduced corruption. I'd be happy to make an introduction. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to close off now. Um, it's been, a, a, I think, a great discussion. We've gone through eight recommendations. Um, please, again, fill in any specific comments if you had a chance to make comments orally that we can incorporate. Um, and I would propose, subject to one, which is on the infrastructure s uh, center, which I think we need to do some more work, that we adopt these subject to the edits that we make. Uh, as we as we move forward, um, and we'll be working very hard on getting the January trip uh, to be set up properly in terms of what we're trying to deliver and achieve in that, and then thinking about our next session together. And I think just reminding ourselves about specificity uh, and actionability in this, so that we know five years from now what sort of a difference that we've made. But uh, thank you very much, everyone, for all your time, and also the secretary. Hosting. Thank you all again, and uh, if I don't see you before, I'll see you in January on our trip. Thank you. Okay, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>